Make sure you subscribe to the Below the Surface podcast by Eclipsium in partnership with CRA. Myself and Scott Shefferman host this show, and we've had the pleasure of speaking with some amazing guests, including Zeno Kova, Richard Hughes, Vincent Zimmer, and more. We discuss topics related to firmware and supply chain security, uncovering those pesky vulnerabilities that lie, well, below the surface in your environments. You can find all the episodes and subscribe by visiting eclipsium.com forward slash podcast or searching for Below the Surface in your favorite podcast catcher. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. We just talked with Dan Kirkendall about what dev leadership looks like and how it can positively influence the direction of security tools, let alone the secure design of apps. I'm your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with John Kinsella and the little black kitty. And it's just about time for the news. But first, what announcement? Join us for one of our Identiverse regional events coming up on December 1st in New York City and December 5th in Chicago. Participate alongside local experts and regional peers in information-rich sessions on the latest technologies, best practices, and industry trends. Trends, I think I said there. Who knows? Secure your complimentary registration at securityweekly.com slash IDV regional events 2023. And Mr. Kinsella, it's... We're recording this the day before Halloween, but it's going to drop the day of Halloween. So let's have something scary and zombie related because those are some of my favorite Halloween monsters. Maybe they'll start with some easy things about what, what, what's a zombie topic in AppSec that you just wish would stay dead and stop rising from the grave. I'm, I'm going to give about five seconds of silence for our listeners to ponder. <laughs> what, do they, what do they think we both came up with as, as the first thing? <laughs> I think they're going to be right. Say it together. One, two, three. Top 10 lists. Um, Top 10 lists. Yep. There we go. So, yeah. Um, and I, I, I think we're going to have fun with this on the on the, the other side. What are the, 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 the non-security? But, yeah, it's what in, you know, we're for our listeners, you know, we're planning ahead. We start to gear up for like what are what we're going to talk about at the end of the year. What are our top 10 lists of the things of the year? Um, our, our best favorite things of the year, or worst things for the year. But. I think um, that's my most, um, beside pumpkin spice app sack, uh, that's my least favorite. Uh, uh, and I'm striving in several different areas to try and stop those from being created, and they're still being created. But I want to try and think, what what else is out there, Mike? Um, and this book I wasn't prepared for. So uh, I, I think, is it like, are we... How, I'm liking a lot of the trends this year. It's good that I'm going positive with this. I'm having a hard time on the negative side. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a, a long list of negatives right now in AppSec. I, I think some of the vendors are starting to, I'm sort of tired of like hearing the same story again and again and not getting fixes. Um, but I think that seems to be, I think the overall the customers are like that too. So I think we're getting less of that. But I don't know, anything sort of pop into your head? Yeah, I, I think for me, um, I, I've had, especially this year, sort of had a bias on communication and awareness. And some of it, obviously, I think comes from, you know, having the, the, the podcast and trying to figure out what, what can grab people. I think for me, a zombie topic would be equating education and security awareness with taxonomies or with trivia, meaning this is phishing, smishing, quishing, all the different ways, rather than saying like, oh, people are trying to obtain your steel credentials. Why don't we just talk about FIDO, MFA? Why don't we talk about patching your system so you don't click on something and it exploits a 90-day-old or a one-year-old vulnerability that you could have patched easily? So I think that's perhaps a zombie topic to, to reorient that type of awareness into what's helping people rather than just saying cross-site scripting type one, type two, DOM-based cross-site scripting, or, or these types of things. More, more, what is the, what is the actual threat or what's going to, what's the impact, what's happening? And how does, does that matter? Do I, does that matter to me? And if so, what could I do? There's a, there's a difference between what a researcher has to focus on and work on. Um, and what we sort of industry nerds Good distinction. care about of like, oh yeah, that's reflected cross-site scripting. If you're trying to figure out in a new form, maybe, Hey, it's, you've figured out, um, you know, I don't know. Conifer based. I'm looking at a tree. Conifer based <laughs> cross site scripting. Um, and like, okay, that's different in some way. So that you need to be able to, part of the reason we have um, certifications and a lot of these things is so that when we talk about things, we're talking about the same thing. And we're able to communicate with the vocabulary. 
Um, so in that case, a reflected XSS is going to make sense if I'm pointing to you about line 35 in you know, some program. Um, in that particularly needs to Good be fixed. Point. And here's an example of how to fix it. But in general, yes, I'm with you. Take a step back and say, how about like, you know, we actually um, do the right thing overall. Um, I, I want to sort of pivot with that point to, um, you know, sort of, oops, I keep kicking my camera today, sorry. Um, what do I like? And I think that's the, the big thing for me mm -hmm. is um, exactly the same point is like, can we, how do we keep things simple? Um, a lot of the things we talk about on here, and we're going to talk about, we're just going through the, the, the list of things we have for the news today. Um, we've got some uh, fuzzing of risk five CPUs, um, automating dead code cleanup. Okay, that's sort of relevant. Um, I had one around agile testing. That's again, sort of relevant. Damn it, I'm not proving my case here. Um, server side sandboxing. A lot of these are really heady, um, really deep, topics that we come up with and we try to throw in and what's going on here right when we go through during the week or at the weekend and, and come up with our list of news we're looking for things which are interesting both to us and also to our listeners but at the same time I want to make clear that like it i recognize that a lot of these things we're talking about they're not going to make a difference in your day-to-day -day life and the reason i'm saying that now is almost from a point of i know i might cringe some people but from an imposter syndrome point of view if you don't have a cpu fuzzing program in your company, that's completely okay, all right? That's um, perfectly fine. <laughs> but at the same time, when we talk about that article in particular, the way they've written this fuzzer is, it, I think there's things to be learned about that. So I think um, at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah, we don't need um, 15 different products. We don't need to make sure that we're covering both um, reflected and conifer XSS um, or, you know, stored versus, oh God, yeah, my, now it's just falling apart. But right, the point being, even I don't stored versus deciduous. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't keep these things in my head. Like I said that to someone recently. I think they got offended. That's not why I'm not working there. But um, yeah, that that's it, it, to me. It comes down to the core of you know having these bases of like, okay, are we are we doing some sort of scanning of our code? Are we you know do we have some baselines? Are we generally improving? Are we um, um, you know are we familiar with a lot of these concepts which we talk about that are in every single one of these top ten lists? It feels like at least eight of them are. Um, are we doing sanitization and encoding and um, encryption and storing and authentication and not rolling our own wheels? Um, that, I don't know, that's the way I think about it. So it's no, uh, it, that's great. I think you you hit on that 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 aspect of shared language so that we can have these informed discussions about what you know does this control does this countermeasure actually work against this type of conifer cross-site scripting or do we need something new or this is the cpu fuzzer that's identifying a side channel versus a cache leak versus a power leak because those are two very distinct types of problems that might come up that need attention and to your point not everybody's designing cpus um as listeners may have noticed every time we bring up a cpu topic i go a little bit light because um my, my you know electrical engineering design class for that was quite a while ago and i've forgotten quite a bit but at the same time, I think, and like I said, sort of the reason why some of these things do light me up is, um, and yeah, I've, I've, there's somewhere around here I've got a tab about, um, actually, I think it's a YouTube video out there right now that I haven't watched yet about how to design your own microprocessor. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to watch this. Um, but it's, it's interesting from that nerdy point of view of like, well, I do a lot of hands on stuff, you know, at the same time, I'm not going to be doing a lot of hands on stuff. Um, and I think it, it, there is a level to me personally of awe in some of the uh, efforts which that people go to for some of these attacks. Um, I always think back to when I was reading through the um, uh, the PLC attack against Siemens in Iraq. Uh, I can't remember the brand name they had on it, but like, man, that was really impressive, right? They literally had to buy the machines and set them up so that they could actually work on um, uh, making the proof concept of this attack. That to me is sort of, it's cool, not that, you know, that it's a very malicious thing, but at the same time, the scale of doing something like that to me is really impressive. So a lot of these things sort of, it's not just purely a, hey, we figured out a slightly better way to um, do encryption because that doesn't float my boat. Um, that's when Mike starts talking. But, and some of these, that, that's, you know, that's to personal interest, but it's, um, hopefully it's interesting to some of our listeners too. 
Hopefully it is. And I think let's try to demonstrate some of that with some fun as well. So one of the things we don't expect everybody to know is C code. I think we've talked in the past a little bit why it's helpful to know C, because then you can understand how you know, how the, the primitives of how other languages are put together or why other languages might also either have memory safety issues as well or not have memory safety, safety issues or concurrency. So that's my little bit of preamble for saying reading code is also educational, especially if there's some fun exploits that we find here in um, one of the, 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 the one of the best text editors out there. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk about this one, John? That's set up. Um... <laughs> Yeah, and I, I want to. I'm going to keep running with that for a second. Um, I think, yeah, we we try to. And I'll, seriously, we say this a lot, and I know you guys hear us in every single podcast you're listening to, folks. But um, it's not so much like and subscribe or leave a comment in the doobly doo below. But like, if you like the more complicated or less complicated things, let us know. Um, I think one of the things we strive to not do here is sensationalize and go like, "Here's how to do the latest attack." Right? We're, we're, we've been thinking about that. So if you guys want to see maybe like a monthly or quarterly, we'll actually go and like set up a VM and like run some of these attacks. Um, we we make this show for you guys, so um, let us know what's interesting. Uh, but Vim is my favorite editor um, in that religious um, argument. One of my favorite ways to, uh, sorry, I'm now, now I'm side topicing, side topicking. One of my favorite interview questions when there's like my manager or a coworkers in the room with a candidate is I'll go, I know we're not supposed to go into religious discussions here during an interview, but I'd really <laughs> like to ask you and like just watching, look in your manager's face when you do that is precious. Um, but anyway, so Vim, my favorite editor, uh, um, has a integer overflow in the colon history command, um, which really sort of tickled me just that like, you know, it's a, this is a package which has been around for a while. Um, and I don't know if this was, I don't think it says, yeah, it doesn't say how it was found. I, it's they they've got a mailing list that they mentioned. They've got a Vim security mailing list. So y'all should go subscribe to that. And out there they, um, uh, I guess probably talked about how they found it. I haven't looked at that. But um, then they also have the patch on here for this. And it was a little more, well, it's a, uh, um, a use after free in the heap um, on how the, mem on, on, well, it's use after free. It was surprising that the patch was a little bit bigger than I expected. For, so from that, so from both the point of view of, I don't think it's vulnerable besides it's a bug, but also there's a, this type of bug in Vim, plus the patch I thought was sort of interesting sort of bring out to folks and look at and think about for all your C code. Um, here, this one's for you. So, and I won't, since it doesn't look like it's exploitable, I won't put you on the spot, John, to create a CVS version 4.0 uh, metric for it because, but I did just throw that in because it should, it's it's slated to be published November 1st, so this week. And um, so everybody out there, you can check out your CVEB, CVS SS, Bs, BEs, and BTS. And um, for you K-pop fans out there, might appreciate some of that as well. I think the only other thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about this is that, it does say right at the right at the launch that the base metrics represent severity, not risk, which is one of those nuanced parts of a discussion that can be important if we're talking about shared language and like, do we care about fixing everything that is a CVSS 10, a 9, an 8? What does that mean in terms of prioritization? And are we doing a risk management or are we just saying this is a bad vuln? but it's not risky because we have other controls. So that was a little bit perhaps of my ranty sneakiness in here, but um, I don't think there's anything else we can beat this poor um, CVSS dead horse onto. You know what I think we're going to need pretty soon? Top 10 list of CVSS. Uh-oh. CVSSs. Top 10 list of CVSS scores. <laughs> um, I was surprised this came out so soon. I thought 3.1 came out relatively recently. It might Maybe that's just, it's been out, it hasn't been adopted as much, but... um. Yeah, let's keep going. We've, we've covered that one enough already. There'll be 5.0 coming out pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, keep going. I did pull in here a, a article from a blog post from Salt about OAuth, as they are making a, a, a fun pun on there, abusing OAuth to take over millions of accounts. And this caught my eye because we just talked with Dan Moore last week about OAuth and some of the design of it. And even what, what was nice in this article is they point out the OAuth has a relatively good, relatively secure design but the implementation can fall over if you're not verifying tokens. And uh, so therefore, if an attacker can say, hey, look, I've completed this OAuth dance and um, here's a token. It just so happens that it's coming from 
the, it looks like it's coming from this victim from from my service. Don't bother verifying it. You can trust me and you've gone in, you've done an account takeover. That seems very simple, but you know, one of the things Dan also talked about was implementation uh, confusion, implementation burden, um, where WebAuth N apparently was actually pretty easy to do for the most part, but OAuth with its longer history, with its lot of um, the extensions that it supports can just be a bit more cumbersome for developers. So this was more of my rhetorical thought process um, question for this, uh, on this topic, in the sense of how could you design a protocol that makes the verification of tokens or makes the verification something that's just more natural, that's harder to skip. And one idea that comes to mind is maybe trying to use like an authenticated encryption primitive, but I don't know how easily that could be done. Or because if we just say, well, just sign it, just use a HMAC of this. If you're not verifying the HMAC or you're only verifying the integrity uh, you, you, I, I'm losing. I, I can't. I can't. You know. I can't say this is a good design either. Either because a developer could easily just skip over this and say, "Cool, it has an HMAC. Let's move on." I think that's um, that's where I was going to go. Actually, your last point. I, I think you can. I think you're you're heading there towards. Um, I'll say a better design. I think you can design these things better. Um, you know, we we've looked at a few different of these systems. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it has to be consumed by a third party. The um, integration has to be, uh, I like the word consume, but there's probably a better word because it, it's, you're, you're working with someone else. It's right. You have to, you can't just do this by yourself. So once you do that, you have to start, I don't want to say lowest common denominator, but let's be honest. Yeah. It has to be something that can be used by a, a large number of people. Right. And it's partially a network effect. Actually, it, this is um, social auth usually, so this is definitely a network effect. Yeah. Um, so it, it has to be something that, that can be consumable in that manner. Could you design something better? Yes. Um, the, the trick is designing something that is both more secure, but also, um, you know, it's, it's easier for people to implement without mistakes. I think that's, we, we've seen some other, I know you're a big fan of yeah. Paseo, if I remember right. Um, I, I think there's other things in here that can be, done and it i think this sort of end of day for me that sort of showed why you know some of the arguments that people make about oauth not being that great or um stand up in court so to speak yeah and i think partially to your point as well it's one thing to have a, a beautiful great design but if nobody's using it you haven't protected anybody and um, hopefully we will not see another OAuth RFC that comes out as the, the yet another hardening guide in addition to the one that already exists of best practices, because that's one of those other anti-patterns. Um, but perhaps some testing or better testing suites could have found such the bug for for these um, vulnerabilities. And I don't, I see some Agile Testing Days conference that uh, came across your radar. Yeah, so I threw this in. Um more for folks to check out. Uh, I heard about this of all places in a discussion on Nextdoor. Um, for folks who don't know what Nextdoor is, probably don't want to know. Um, it's a place <laughs> where you go. It's a place where you gather and like say all the worst things about your neighbors. <laughs> um, uh, there was a, an account on Twitter or X, whatever they call it out there. It's pretty great. But anyways, um, yeah. So the in in that context, uh, Agile Testing Days used to have another name, and they used to actually, as part of the conference, have um, uh, invite teams of QA testers to gather and actually test a common application. So you'd be given, this is an application, you've got this much time, go and test this functionality, which to me sounds like, it sounds really great, right? Because I think um, one of the problems I've seen over many companies, big and small, um, and government orgs, is we frequently, our testing is is often really sort of just slapdash, sort of, you know, go in, we might buy a tool, we might even configure a tool correctly, but usually it's going to be some sort of, ah, it looks good enough, right? Um, so I think for many people, um, even just watching the, the some of the, go browse through the program for this, and hopefully they're going to have the recordings up online. I'm, I'm not familiar with it yet. I just found it this weekend. Um, I, I bet there's a lot of things which we can sort of learn as a overall. Um, I mean, they're covering topics like AI testing, automation, leadership. I'm talking about leadership again, um, DevOps, performance testing, agile testing, continuous delivery, 
testing techniques and best practices. This could sound super boring, but I think it could be really interesting. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's my two cents. For those of you who are in Germany, you might get to go check it out in person. It's uh, just south um, west of uh, Berlin. But uh, hopefully they'll have videos online. Yes. And we have a new motto for 2024. This could sound boring, but we're super <laughs> in interesting. Application Security Weekly. Um, other things that I've been trying to do this year is we do talk about Vulns and we started purposely off talking about the, the, the you know, an integer overflow in Vim because they can be educational. One of the things I've been trying to do is also bring in articles about design or design choices or architectures. Um, and in this case, it is from a Figma blog who's talking about server-side sandboxing. So this is not sandboxing on your iOS app or the sandboxing of your browser like Chrome or WebKit, th those types of choices or Safari. And um, it's part of a th it's the first of a three-part series that I hope they continue to come out uh, relatively quickly. And the isolation here they're talking about is, I, I think, rather coarse, at least from my perspective, or how I would talk about that perhaps in a shared language of talking about virtual machines, containers. Um, but then they do start to talk about set comp, which can get into, you know, some some really granular, this is call we'll accept, but not this is call. But once you start doing that, I think maybe, maybe to riff a little bit on our OAuth discussion, Ooh, you actually have to have something that developers can implement. Um, and I think, you know, part near the bottom, they talk about development costs and friction, maintenance and operational overhead. And honestly, I would pull those two categories perhaps almost at the top before the security and performance discussions. Obviously, we need to know, is this, is, is this a measure of isolation rather than just like containers or security? Um, but developers actually have to implement that is I think the takeaway. And this is coming from a developer blog, not a security pitch. So um, I have high hopes that this will be educational and we'll get some more examples of how, you know hurdles and challenges that they've run into and how they've solved that from an engineering perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, this, this would be worth, you know, spending half a day playing with. If you're in this space and you're using containers, um, and I'm saying this from a guy who created and ran a container security startup. I'm sort of familiar with this. Uh, yeah, don't do set comp by yourself. It's, yeah, you just don't want to go down that path. Um, it, it's it's quite neat in what it can do. Uh, there are defaults, sane defaults in Docker already, uh, in the Docker engine. Um, but what they pointed to here, which is sort of interesting, I've looked at it before, is uh, the NSJL, NSJL.dev. Uh, which is sort of a toolkit to make this stuff a lot easier. Because if you try to write this stuff by, like I said, by yourself, um, I'm I'm happy to talk about that as long as you want to. But uh, it's 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 not a fun time. Um, so yeah, I I suspect if if you're playing with containers, if you're looking to sandbox them or do something a little bit better, I mean, also go look at like Firecracker, some of the, some of those sort of uh, um, uh, micro um, advisors. I think are pretty neat for this type of stuff, but. Um, Again, I think the overall point is, at least from my point of view, container is not a security construct. Go look at this or something like it. So let's let's start to go in some of that that nerdy route, John. And this once again, um, let's see just how much of a poster I can be. Uh, you have a CPU fuzzer. Yes, I here. Do. <laughs> um, one of those one of those stories which our listeners are going to be implementing uh, this afternoon for sure. Uh, yes. And maybe if you've got some risk risk five CPUs around, um, I think some of the ESP thirty twos might be risk five. I think one of them is. Um, but so they're starting to be used. So risk five is a I think we've talked about before. It's an open source um, CPU architecture. Um, there's a, a few com few companies, few small startups pushing in. A few large companies have adapted it, adopted it. Uh, but okay, well you know we've we've talked a few stories here recently about CPU fuzzing. Intel, I think AMD, um, Google's doing some work in this space. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the, I'm gonna make sure I get this name right. The Swiss, uh, got screwed up. The, Sw the Swiss Federal Institute of Te Technology in Zurich, I think I got it, um, came up with this program called Cascade. And Cascade is a fuzzer specifically written, uh, it's so far for RISC V CPUs. Um, and what's sort of neat about this thing, beside what they found so far, is They've written in such a way that the programs which are being generated uh, to then fuzz a CPU 
um, will be uh, will will exit cleanly and successfully if there's no problem. So some of the ones we've talked about in the past, they're just sort of throwing bytecode and junk at the CPU or you know application or API depending on what you're trying to fuzz. And one of the problems with that is then you get this results back. It's like okay, well that's cool. Like where was the bug? So the way this the system generates the the fuzzer generates the programs to test. It's doing it in a way that like when it crashes, you're like, oh, it's this really particular thing that's like, I need to go and look at that and I'll figure it out. So I thought that was sort of neat and how they're doing it. Um, but on the statistics side, uh, they've got a white paper, which I think comes out this week. Can't believe it's November, about to be. Uh, 37 new bugs, 29 of those are CBEs. So again, this isn't like something which is, as I say in the, the paper, it's, it's not as huge of a deal to the average person because like, we're not running risk five on our desktop. Um, this is not the same risk as we had in, uh, um, you know, sun machines of old and things like that. Uh, fairly new over the last 10 years. But um, yeah, it, if you're into the microcontroller space or if you're into thinking about like, how do we how do we test from a point of view of, um, you know, completion and making it easier to, to recognize when something failed, not just that it failed, right? So if you can bring it back to reality, if you've got like a website that you're running and we um, try to secure and someone points a fuzzer at it or a, you know, a scanner and suddenly your website's down. It's like, okay, well, that's cool, but how do I fix that? Right. So how would you go about making that a little more targeted or knowing which attack caused that to fail or things like that? That's what they're doing here is CPU level and sort of pretty cool. It's cool. Sort of and I cool. wanted to tie it to the, um, the, the LibWebP. Um, yes. issue that we covered a couple of weeks ago because that was not found by fuzzing, even though that code was fuzzed. And to your point here about the what the researchers here at the the Swiss Institute, I will say uh, more briefly without the pronunciation challenges, is um, that the the quality of the fuzzer. What is it exercising? What code paths can it go down? Is it can it deal with Huffman encoding, which was the LibWebP aspect, which then I think it was Google came out with a fuzzer extension that can do that specifically. So there's still a lot of, I think, work there, or uh, this is how I want to roll back and rephrase what I was going to say. Fuzzing, I, I'm a fan of fuzzing tools because they find crashes and crashes, whether they're exploitable or not, are quality issues, fix them. Um, so the quality of a good fuzzer that can leverage, exercise your code is just a great thing to to do. Um, in the spirit of Halloween, we also, we, we want to exercise code and code paths with our fuzzers, but there's also dead code that we need to go out and bury and put into a mausoleum somewhere. Um, and I can't do a really good Vincent Price impression to my great dismay. So that's the best you're going to get out of me. So um, John, take it over from here. Have faith in our producers to be able to sort of throw some filters on your voice. Um, yeah, so this is something called SCARF, uh, the Systematic Code and Acid Removal Framework that Meta has uh, come up with and, and released. Uh, combined static and dynamic analysis for programs. I'm reading from their bullets. I have read the article, but really, what they're doing here is they've they've, you know, it. What I said in the the show notes. Um, at least for me, one of the areas I really like machines or automation is to do things that humans either can't do or um, are too lazy to do, or it, it costs too much for us to do, or maybe we shouldn't do. Um, and on that last one, uh, Mike, I'm sure you've had that fun thought of when you're like looking at some code and you're like, this looks like it's not being used. Let's remove that function. Um, or let's remove that line of code. And like, everything's great. And then like five weeks later, something breaks. And I was like, what happened? Uh, um, I may have done that more than twice. <laughs> yes. So what this fine uh, uh, application here does is it tries to avoid the, the five week later part. And I think that's something that a machine's going to be good at, right? Because if presuming it has all the right data, that, which I think they've got it here. Um, and that said, I think one of the inter interesting parts about trying to integrate this yourself is making sure that you're able to get it that same, same type of data. So um, what Meta's done is they, they're not just doing, you know, um, looking through a code graph of, of the application. Um, it sounds like they've got it working pretty well. They're able to find, if you have a bit of dead code, which actually references another bit of dead code, which references it. So you have like a little sort of cycle in there of like a you know, separate planet, which never gets used. They're able to find that and remove that type of code as well. Um, oh, and by the way, at the end of all these things, when it finds something that's bad, it sends a pull request. So it goes and does crunchy, crunchy and it tests and sends something. And then you go, oh, not using that, remove. Um, but also what they're doing is they're looking at, um, 
invocations from logs uh, and other sort of analytics they're able to get their hands on. They've, they've got, I believe, in here a, if I'm not getting my stories mixed up, um, the ability to, I might be getting my stories mixed up. I think I am, yeah. Um, but so it's, it's <laughs> sorry, they, even with this at, at that point, this is something which is, you know, it's, um, if you're able to go through a code graph in, a, in an automated fashion, compare that with logs of how the application's actually being used and called, um, that's pretty close to as good as you're going to get. I think the only way you could do better than that is if you actually had um, SecComp or some other sort of debugger tied just that bad boy so you're getting debug output from it to see what it's really doing, uh, which starts having performance issues. Uh, but I, I don't know. This is something, if I get time, I really want to play with it. Um, so I thought I'd bring it up here for, for you and our listeners to sort of take a, a look see it. Yeah, and I'm I'm a fan of shrinking code because I I don't think that anybody can reasonably keep the a, a mental model of a complex even a small code base very effectively over time. But shrinking code just reduces your attack surface to use the bingo phrase, and it's just a great way of removing cruft that can make it easier to document, understand, and just deal with. So it, it's a wonderful aspect. Now, and, and so that is, I think, I, I do like the point about that's where AI can be helpful. Conversely, I did bring in a nightshade tool, an article about this nightshade tool that has a little bit more uh, cyberpunk and dystopian type of um, AI uh, to it in the sense of artists seeing that their art that is, being, is being used and co-opted, stolen, and used to train without consent uh, models, um, generative AI models. And what's neat about this is now we've got some adversarial activity, um, adversarial ways of tweaking a bunch of pixels that our human eyes don't pick up, but those machine learning models do and start to poison that data so that now that a um, particular artist style doesn't become reflected within a generative AI. And this is building on glaze, which I want to say came out several months before. I just, I forgot to refresh my memory on that timeline, but uh, this is a university of Chicago, I believe, or a group out of Chicago um, doing this research. So it's pretty interesting to see. And it still, I think, ties into an AppSec angle in the sense of how is data being used and what is, and, and misused, and what does it mean for data poisoning is this a good thing bad thing um there's there's possibly some some fun longer conversations along that we could have along those 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 angles yeah i think we're going to be having we as a, a larger group group are going to be having fun with this type of um we'll call it an error um for for a while call it a bug and i think you know as you're sort of talking through it there mike i think one of the things which is interesting is um that seems to be my word of the day but uh, one of the things which is I note of in this is the machine learning systems are not very good at AppSec. So, um, you know, and I, I've got this whole separate tirade, which we might go on another time, but like is, you know, machine learning in AppSec, how good is that? Where do you use it? If <laughs> machine, if machine learning, if the machine learning isn't aware of AppSec itself and it keeps getting fooled by these relatively simple things, um, should we be trusting it for securing our code? Just going to leave that a little bit more silence in there because that's a, that's almost a good mic drop and we should possibly just end there on a good <laughs> scary question from, from John, but I don't quite want to end this yet. Maybe let's squeeze in a couple more articles real quick. There's a state of DevOps report from Google cloud. I apologize because it is yet another registration wall, but I downloaded the PDF so you wouldn't have to. And two things, three things stood out to me. I liked that it's calling attention to the quality of written content that people use, basically documentation. Quality documentation is good. It doesn't mean volume. It doesn't mean everything has to be documented. It just means you have some quality that can, others can learn from. And maybe this ties in a little bit to the leadership that Dan was saying in the sense of, here's where our vision is, so you don't have to repeat it verbally every time, but also that mentoring so that senior developers actually document their code and so that can be explained to juniors or juniors are documenting in terms of, do they understand concepts? Can they convey it well? Um, so the documentation, I wanted to stretch that in there. There's trunk-based development. That's possibly another religious war, and but user centrism. I wanted to throw that in there too. The idea of are we actually solving problems that users have, or are we just 
building projects rather than products to um, try to be a little bit pithy with that alliteration. Mm. I haven't read it because there's a, uh, usually I'll download these, but this one I didn't get a download. Uh, but just hitting off one of those points, you said, yeah, the religious concepts of uh, um, trunk-based developments. We, we switched over to that in my last startup. Um, I previously, and I still am to a degree, a big fan of um, Gitflow. Uh, it there, there's definitely some. It, it's it's for those who haven't looked. I think we've probably covered it before, but for those who haven't looked at it closely, it's um, it requires you thinking through a different way to um, a different mindset for the overall team. Um, Probably a little bit like jumping into Scrum for the first time for those who who have gone through that fun experience, but uh, the results are really interesting. It's I think for there's that word again. I think for um, for a lot of projects there there's value in it going to trunk based development, but it it definitely sort of requires you to, to sort of um, do more in a simple think. And perhaps too, you know, part of the, the 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 thrust of this report is talking about maturity and the size of org. So this isn't saying that everyone should do this. It's more of does this fit your org? And a little bit, I think of that came out when your your discussion with Dan talking about like what should startups be doing, like in terms of figuring out do we implement this feature because a customer requested it? Do we implement it because the customer will pay for it? Um, the, 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 the the answer is not always just yes. And that was also what Dan was also highlighting in the sense of his, his fun clickbait title of series that went into some nuanced and good discussion. John, I have one last one article that I want to cover because Halloween themed, we bring the specter back. So it's a, it's, it's, it's an old vulnerability that has some new life in it. Um, some researchers out of some more universities, um, uh, which they have an architecture dot fail there. This is their hardware security lab. So I think that's a great domain name that, uh, Georgia tech, um, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology got, but the eye leakage is basically demonstrating the specter vulnerability in pure JavaScript and WebAssembly. So we've answered our question. We found a use for WebAssembly this year. That's good. Uh, but perhaps the, you know, pulling out some other aspects of this, talking about design is that this was reported over 400 uh, days ago. Um, and they're saying they're just now releasing it. There's some partial fixes within 17.1, the recent Mac OS updates, but the fixes themselves are still not complete. And this is because CPU vulnerabilities, these types of side channels are very difficult to counter. But one of the things they did point out is that the lockdown mode on iOS does counter this because specifically it reduces or it disables JIT. And the JIT with JavaScript is a notorious area that has been compromised. So it's interesting. I wanted to pull that in the sense of, you know, lockdown is a design that reduces some functionality, but does it in a transparent way saying you might have a threat model, you might have concerns where you it's okay to not pre-render a web page or pre-render a video in an iMessage. If that's okay, because you're more worried and you're more paranoid from, I, I, I don't want to use the word paranoid because that has an implication of unmeasured or unthoughtfulness in your security. If you have some thoughtful security, turn on lockdown mode. And this is one example where that would have helped you. So that was my design and Halloween all in one. So I'll throw it over to you, John, to see how, how, how do you want to end us on a, on a trick or treat for this Halloween episode? Love the architecture.fail. And I see they have a few other .fail domains too, including SGF. Oh yeah, it's SGX great writing. Yeah. .fail. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they've, they've uh, um, this was, yeah, uh, let's see, if I want to go somewhere else, um, I'm going to go back to there was this just came out this morning. Uh, there's three vulnerabilities in Nginx, the um, Kubernetes Ingress uh, version of Nginx. Uh, the top one uh, uh, on the scary list for me is uh, there is a ability for arbitrary command execution by inject injecting uh, those commands into an annotation on um, what is it called there? I don't remember me. Um, and I'm really good at not finding things today. A configuration snippet. So in Nginx, uh, the version for Kubernetes, this would be used as uh, your ingress controller. So the idea is this, it's a load balancer basically for, for Kate's uh, form of. 
Uh, so in the configuration snippet annotation, you'd put custom uh, configuration for Nginx in there to have it passed down in through your um, uh, Kubernetes configuration systems um, and annotation systems when it loads. Uh, and there's the ability to go ahead and put something in there, which will turn around and get executed by the uh, uh, Nginx container, which probably gonna be running with, with decent permissions. Um, and yeah, that that's uh, uh, got ranked pretty highly, ranked high actually, not just highly high on CBSS 3.1. They're not using 4.0 yet. But anyways, there's this and two others on the um, Kubernetes um, security list that were announced last week. I think what I think is a comment on, on the other side of this when I first went looking for them this morning to throw them in, they're not listed. They're not using the, while well, they're using GitLab, excuse me, GitHub, they're not putting these into the GitHub security space. The security page just says, go look at the mailing list. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, but is that a way to improve? I would think so. But anyway, that, that's my scary for the, my last scary for the show. Ah, uh, thank you for that. It's, and it's always a treat having you, John. So thank you once again for co-hosting. Uh, we will have more tricks up our sleeve as we end the year. Dun, dun, dun. Dramatic music and another Vincent Price voice. But as Vincent Price would say, possibly, thank you for joining us. Um, but it'd be much deeper and moodier. But I will say thank you for joining us, listeners. Thanks once again to John. Please do subscribe. Hit that like button. Check out the show notes and let us know the types of articles that you like and the direction we can go. We can go... Um, deeper we can go bre breadth we can go more volumes we can go fewer volumes we can do all sorts of things and we'd love to hear what we, what our listeners would like to hear i think i said that correctly um but speaking of listening to things and speaking of halloween do check out anthology 2 from john carpenter good classic movie soundtracks from horror movies we'll see you next time in november for application security weekly mm -hmm.